Our next speaker is Parker Smale on breeding special concern uh, Bombus terracola and common Canadian bumblebee species. I'm Parker Smale. I'm here with Wildlife Preservation Canada, where I'm a bumblebee lab biologist. Wildlife Preservation Canada is a conservation organization based here in Ontario in Guelph. Our mission is to save animal species at risk from extinction in Canada by providing direct hands-on care. And so we deal with a lot of different species. We have a few different projects on the go, but of course my team's favorite species is the yellow-banded bumblebee, Bombus tericola. So that's what I'll be talking about with you guys today. So again, you guys are all bee people, you know the bees are not doing very well, bumblebees included. So here's some data from the IUCN. Half of all North American bumblebees are at least concerned, so they're doing all right. Uh, about a quarter of them are either vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. And the other, about a quarter or 20%, we just are not sure. That doesn't mean that they're doing well. That just means that we don't know uh, because there isn't enough data about them. So in our lab, we deal with Bombus tericola, as I mentioned, and so it is in the vulnerable category, according to the IUCN, uh, according to COSEWIC, which is the Canadian organization dealing with kind of species categorization and status, it is of special concern. Originally, when we started our conservation breeding lab, we were interested in the rusty patch bumblebee, which you can see in the photo up there. Uh, that photo, by the way, is from the Xerces Society. I just forgot to cite it, my mistake. But uh, it is a critically endangered bumblebee, according to the IUCN here, uh, as well as according to Coast Seaway, it's endangered. But we haven't really been able to rear it because, as many of you might know, it hasn't been seen in Canada at all since 2009. So if we can't find it, we can't uh, breed it. So we've kind of shifted our focus to the yellow-banded bumblebee, to hope that we can help out those wild populations before it gets to a critically endangered state like the rusty patch. So in our lab, we rear not only the yellow banded bumblebee, but also a couple of common species. So right now we have the yellow banded bumblebee, we have the brown belted bumblebee, and then this year we also added uh, or switched it up a little bit by rearing the tricolor bumblebee or Bombus ternarius. We rear common species on top of our focal species, basically just to bring our numbers up, especially for experiments. We want to make sure that we have enough bees to get data from without having to take a bunch of this vulnerable species out of the wild. So we use more common species to, to help out with that. Our shift away from the brown belted bumblebee and towards the tricolor bumblebee is because the tricolored is more closely related to the yellow banded but that's all kind of an internal thing not too much for you guys to worry about one thing you might notice is that these are all kind of uncommon bumblebees uh especially in the literature uh as we heard yesterday during one of the talks the vast vast majority of bumblebee literature and research is on honeybees Within bumblebees, most of the research is on Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, which we've heard about a lot, as well as Bombus terrestris, which is a European bumblebee. Uh, and so our conservation breeding program, we're still trying to learn more about these bumblebees for sure, be able to compare and contrast bumblebees that aren't doing well in the wild with those that are doing well in the wild, uh, but also just find out how best to rear these bumblebees that don't have a lot of research about them. So really quick, the bumblebee life cycle, they have an annual life cycle. So most of the colony dies off around now uh, in the year, in the fall and leading into winter, most of the colony will die off. The only ones that survive are the new queens or gynes. They hibernate or overwinter solitarily and then will start their own colonies in the spring. So in the spring is when we go out and catch our queens. We use wild caught queens every year. I use at least every year so far. I'll get a bit more into that later. Uh, the issue or one of the issues with wild caught queens is that we don't know where they've been or what they've been doing. 
we have no idea if they're in great shape. Obviously, there are some ways you can tell when you look at them, uh, what's going on with them. Like if they're covered with mites, we're not going to take them, but we're not sure if they've mated. Uh, we're not sure if they might have pathogens or parasites. Uh, we're really just going out there and catching bees and some of them we bring back to the lab. Some other metrics we look at when we're considering how well our conservation breeding is going is number one, colony initiation. So is the queen that we have producing workers? Later on in the life cycle, we like to see that she's producing reproductives, so that's males and gynes, as well as that they are successfully mating. And then we like to see that they are also successfully overwintering or living. We want to see how long they're living during overwintering. So in the wild, they would go outside and they would bury themselves under the ground or under leaf litter. We uh, keep them in a fridge. Uh, in our lab, we have a little mini fridge that right now is just packed full of bees, but it, we make do. Uh, a note on pathogens. So one of the things that we do like to do to try and get a sense of what is going on with this bee, with these bees when we catch them is we can identify some pathogens and parasites non-lethally, so without killing the bees that we have. Usually we do fecal sampling to test for Crithidia and Baromorpha slash Nosema. So we just put a bee in a Petri dish like you see there, uh, wait for them to poop, and then we use just visual detection, looking at that poop under a microscope to see what's going on. Unfortunately, because that's a somewhat unreliable method, since we're using human eyeballs to look at that poop, we have a limited kind of use case. We use it to split up our bees to kind of like quarantine zones so that they don't infect each other. But we're hoping to, in the future, move towards genomic analysis, which will mean we can test for more different pathogens as well as be more reliable. We're also doing some uh, testing with pollen. Uh, as we heard for earlier from Gordon, there can be a lot of medicinal uses of different chemicals and compounds that are found in plants. Recently, the past three years, we've been looking into red maple pollen, which you can see here. It's a super like dark green pollen, which is really interesting. So we've been trying to see if that is helpful for infections of Baromorpha as well as Crithidia, but our results have been kind of up and down over the years. So we're not 100% sure about that yet. However, this year in general, uh, most of the metrics that I talked about in on sort of the life cycle page, things have been going really good. So I'm basically here to share with you guys what we changed this year and well, what we changed this year that we think went really well for everyone. So number one, uh, we saw a lot more colony initiation than usual. We attribute this mostly to, we started using incubators so uh, they are not very high tech. Uh, you all are scientists, so I'm sure you're used to the situation where you want some really specific piece of equipment and it either is insanely expensive or does not exist. So this is just a kind of incubator shell that we built around our shelves in the lab. We were able to, using incubators, we could keep the bees at a bit of a higher temperature without us ourselves having to work at like 28 to 30 degrees. We also changed our nectar formulation. Previously, we just used a uh, simple sucrose syrup as well as some supplements added in there. This year, we added glucose and fructose so that it's more similar to what they would find in the wild. And then lastly, we disturbed them less. This was partially because we would like to disturb them less. Uh, that stresses them out less. They have more time to be brooding and doing nest things, but also it meant less work for us. We went from checking them every other day to checking them every four days. And as you can see here, that was super helpful. So we have the stuff in brown is the brown belted bumblebee, the stuff in yellow is the yellow banded, and then the red is the tricolored. That'll be all throughout the presentation. The tricolored we only reared this current year, so I don't have anything from 2022, but just kind of there is a comparison. So we did see significantly more queens were initiating colonies and producing workers this year as opposed to last year, which is awesome. But does that mean that the colonies were successful? Uh, yes and no, that's one metric we look into, but an even more important metric that we like to look at is gyne production. 
So production of those new queens. So in this picture, you can see not all of those are new queens. Uh, the really dark one at the top is the original queen. And then some other of the chonkers running around there, those are new queens that we've yet to collect. So gun production is arguably the most important or indicative measure of colony success, especially considering we're a conservation breeding lab. So again, this year we saw not as much with the brown belted bumblebee, but with our yellow banded bumblebee, we definitely saw a significant increase in the number of gynes that were produced. That's really super interesting to me. It kind of falls in line with the fact that um, the fact that yellow banded bumblebees are a bit more picky, whereas brown belted bumblebees last year they were doing all right, and this year they continue to do all right. But we'll see what happens as we move forward and if that continues to be a trend or not. Uh, you can also see that our tricolor bumblebees did produce a significant number of gynes. Uh, so that is a good sign that we can continue on with working with that species. Another huge milestone that we hit this year was we saw our first like observed confirmed tericola mating, a uh, yellow banded bumblebee mating. Last year, we only had a few yellow banded bumblebee gynes and the rest were brown belted. Out of 150 mating trials that we set up over the summer last year, we saw one mating and that was very, I mean, the mating itself was very exciting for us, but overall that's a pretty low uh, success rate. Whereas this year we saw at least uh, 10 confirmed matings uh, between our yellow banded and our tricolored bumblebees which is awesome. It also means that we have the potential to, if those gynes survive overwintering until April, we can start an F1 generation, which would be awesome. We attribute this partially to, to doing indoor mating trials. So last year they were outside in a mesh tent, which there are many problems that go along with that. Whereas this year we were able to kind of convert part of our lab to a uh, white light space where they could do mating. That was great. And then we also attribute that partially to species specific mating strategies. So like I mentioned last year, almost all of the mating trials we did were with the brown belted bumblebee. And if you look at brown belted bumblebee males, they are more similar to the to honeybee drones, for example, they have really huge eyeballs. And that's because they use a more visually focused mating strategy than other bumblebees. And having this different mating strategy probably means that they're going to have different requirements for wanting to be in the mood to do mating. We don't have all of our results from overwintering yet. Obviously, it is not even winter yet. It's only fall, so we won't know until next spring. But so far, our overwintering has been looking really good uh, based on six-week survival rates uh, of our about 150 gynes that are in overwintering. That's number one due to simulation of natural conditions. So we kind of stole slash collaborated with Sabrina Rondeau uh, from University of Guelph to steal her method for overwintering gynes. Let me see. So you might be able to see here is a gyne kind of burying herself in some soil that we have a test tube. We have her in the test tube with the soil and she's kind of digging down into it, which is very cool to see. Uh, last year, we just had each gyne stored individually in a little cardboard jewelry box. Uh, but this way, it kind of simulates their natural conditions a bit more, helps keep humidity up, uh, and a few other things. So we're optimistic about that. Also, since we had like an insane amount of gynes produced in our lab, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't keep them all. We have one mini fridge to keep these in, and it filled up very quickly. Uh, surprisingly quickly, we just weren't anticipating this level of success, basically. So it was sad that we had to get rid of some, but on the plus side, that meant we got to choose the cream of the crop for who went into overwintering. So moving forward, as I mentioned, we want to do genomic uh, analysis for our fecal sampling. We're going to continue with pollen studies, including exploring the effect of late flowering pollen on fine weight and survival, and then also um, do some dissections to identify potentially any missed meetings. So there are a lot of different variables I talked about. Uh, we don't know which ones affected everything, or we don't know which ones affected different variables completely because there are just too many moving parts. 
and we can only run one generation per year because of their annual life cycle and just because of our limitations as a lab. But what we can say is that we're one step closer to re-releases. So thank you to a lot of different people and uh, I'm out of time, but feel free to track me down during the break for any questions.